Crossroads Media. What is going on, everyone? Welcome on into Sports Talk with Bro. It's a very disappointing game for the Philadelphia Phillies. But I'll say something that I said after the Marlins' first two games. Remember, that was a double header to start things off after the All-Star break. They won game one. They lost game two. There were still two more games to go. So I stated, just give it time to see what plays out before we can fully put our assessment on what's happening against the Marlins. Well, with the Yankees, I expected a split. In a two-game set, it's weird, it's wonky, you can't demand a sweep, you definitely can't get swept. But if you split the two games, I will feel okay moving along back to Philadelphia to play the Atlanta Braves. So... I know it looks stacked against you. You have a bullpen game. More problems with COVID. You have J.D. Hammer and now Bailey Falter not available for you. And keep in mind, Falter has been able to give you some innings. He's been able to eat for you a tad. So something that you are clearly missing out on. And that impacted the way Joe Girardi managed this game. Look, as soon as Kinsler entered, I tweeted, this smells like the Phillies are going to give up a run. As soon as De Los Santos got fired into the game, you knew there was going to be a run scored. These pitchers are not good. But the reason why the Phillies lost this baseball game is not Joe Girardi putting in the wrong guys or Joe Girardi waving the white flag. It's the fact that Didi Gregorius is causing so many problems on the defensive side of the diamond. Your offense had, what, bases loaded. JT Real Muto ends up grounding into an inning-ending double play. Before that, Reese Hoskins strikes out looking. Big time K. Didi Gregorius, big time K against Chad Green. They go to Chad Green. He throws some ugly pitches early. At one point, it was six straight balls. Six straight balls after walking Andrew McCutcheon on four straight pitches. So, what well, was it? Six balls after those four. It was six total. 2-0 count. Reese Hoskins lets it go. Lets it rip. Fouls the ball back. Okay, then here comes 95 miles per hour on the outside part of the dish. And for the third strike, was it a ball? It was super damn close. If you look at the box, it was clearly shifted to the left of the box. But if you take that away and look at where it landed on the plate, I mean, it was dicey. It was hairy. It was one of those calls that you have to protect in that moment. If that's going to be a K, that's a K. It could possibly be. It's a flip of the coin, basically. It could be either or. In that moment, the strike zone expanded. I'm not mad at the umpire for calling that a K. That's the nature of the game. It was a hell of a pitch. And Didi Gregorius goes down right after that with some blistering fastballs that he could not come up with whatsoever. By the way, Aaron Nola was a disaster, too. He sucked today, okay? And they're using the excuse of he had a lot of time off. Well... He had a lot of time off due to his decisions. I'm not a political guy. I'm not going to tell somebody they have to do something. It's their own choice if they want to or not, in my opinion. But here's what I will say. You can't then use that as an excuse for why you're struggling or why you had a bad outing. It was a decision you made. You have to live with the consequences. And keep in mind, I'm not telling you what's right or wrong. I'm not telling you what you have to do. But just know this is hurting the organization if you're not going to do it. So while you're in a run and you're fighting and competing with the New York Mets who lost the game to the Reds tonight and you had a chance to maybe slither your way up the division even just a little bit more, but you failed, this is costing you. These decisions made, there's a cause and an effect. You're watching it all play out in front of your eyes. So there's no one to blame but the individuals in this situation that are not getting it done. Right? It might be a factor on why things are happening, but you need to own up to that. You can't be using excuses. You're losing, putting your team in a bad spot by your actions. How bad do you want to win? How much do you want this behind the organization and franchise? Just do what you need to do and move the fuck on. But here we are with a lot of issues 
and a lot of problems right now. And look, the Yankees have issues of their own, but that makes it even worse. You know, Aaron Nola struggling against this line. It's not their full lineup. You're walking batters in the fifth inning. They're stealing second base. I mean, the dude could fly. He had a triple. That was a third. It got him to third base, which scored a run. But Aaron Nola's walking guys, putting them on with zero outs. What do you expect is going to happen when you make those mental mistakes? 10 of 19 starts now. Fewer than six innings pitched. Long period off for him, as we alluded to. Fastball had no life tonight at all. And how about what Ruben Amaro said at the end of the game on the broadcast? So many times he thought it was a curveball count. So many times he questioned, why are they throwing a fastball in that moment? And it goes back to the conversation we have with JT Real Muto. How many times do we question, well, how come Hector Neris went fastball instead of splitter? Or why did he go with the splitter in that moment where maybe he could have went fastball? Well, why is Aaron Nola forcing the fastball there? Where It's clear that he doesn't have it on that night. Now, you can't live with change-up curveball sometimes. That's going to bite you in the ass as well if you only work with those pitches and then the other hitters realize that they sit on it and then they can crush one but I'm watching them crush your fastball as well something's got to give I just find it fascinating that Ruben Amaro Jr. brings that up because it's always somewhat resurfacing ERA for Aaron Nola after the last 12 starts 586 the home run to Sanchez leaving the ball middle in That thing was murdered. If you looked at Andrew McCutcheon, I was cracking the hell up. He didn't even move. Didn't even give it the time of day. Wouldn't even glance back at all for one damn second. 50,000 feet in the air. I swear to God, that thing was crushed. Gardner. Now, the Gardner one, complete opposite. That was a home run in no ballpark in Major League Baseball except for Yankees Stadium. The expected batting average of that home run was 050. That's the expected batting average because it ends up being caught and a fly ball in any other ballpark. But I don't care. I don't care. It's a home run in Yankee Stadium. The Phillies have the same exact advantage. Hit it to the small porch, right? I mean, it's it's not like the Yankees have the advantage and nobody else is hitting in this ballpark on that given night. I don't care that it affected Aaron Nola. It was a problem. Then he allows the double. You got to bring in Jose Alvarado in the sixth inning. It gets really ugly, really murky. Huge double play to get out of that jam. You know, the Yankees had plenty of chances to make it even more than just a 6-4 to four game. For as many issues as the Phils had for the timely hit, yeah, you're damn right that the Yankees did too. But they had just enough. You know, they were not only hitting the home runs, they had some solo shots, which is how they normally generate majority of their offense. But as I alluded to earlier, speed on the base paths, getting walked, stealing second, moving over to third base on a just a pretty standard fly out to center field. It wasn't deep. Speed, speed, speed. Speaking of small ball, I had no idea. The Phillies took advantage of the Yankees in one moment where there was a balk involved and Torres hits one to score a run. that I believe that made it 2-1 because Reese Hoskins hit a bomb to start things off to give them a 1-0 lead. Then they lost the lead. Then Torres put them back up 2-1. What the hell was Jankowski doing trying to bunt the baseball? You had a man on second base, two outs, and here's... Jankowski bunning away? What's the baseball sense there? What's the logic in that situation? I really would love to know what was happening because it's stupid. That's what it is. The answer is that was just absolutely pathetic. So who gave him the signal and who told him to do that? Because they should be fired on the damn spot. Yeah, I, I feel bad for Joe because I don't think he had a lot of options knowing where tomorrow is going to bring them. And, of course, that all happens because we hear the news about Zach Eflin and his injury. Now, they don't anticipate it being anything so serious where they want to fix his hole in the lineup in the starting rotation. But I'll tell you what, my gut feeling tells me as the time moves forward, it's only going to linger and it will resurface its ugly head once again. I don't see it being something that's going to go away, so it's not going to make me feel any better as they as they play, right? It's like, oh, he might be pushing through it. Well, pushing through it 
doesn't really change the issue here now, does it? Zach Eflin needs to be healthy and available if he's going to battle through this injury and this nicked up problem. That doesn't make me feel very good because I don't see it getting any better. He's just going to be competing through pain. And no offense to Zach Eflin, but he's not the top of the top of the top of the league that I say I'll live and die with Zach Eflin on the mound, healthy or not healthy, because he's our guy. I don't feel that way. Now, just to give you a little bit of a description on what it is with his injury. And I know that he has had this before in the past. So keep in mind, it is something that has now reoccurred. This is a noise that you do not need to hear. And I hate this website for playing it. Eflin's assignment to the IL was backdated to Saturday. Eligible to come off the IL in one week. He will miss two starts. It is a patellar tendonitis. He had surgery on both knees to alleviate the problem back in 2016. So that definitely does not feel great in my eyes, even though they're only expecting a couple starts. I don't know. My gut tells me that they're wrong, but I hope I'm wrong. That's how I'll leave it. I hope I'm wrong. Oh, What else was very painful in this one? I, I mentioned that Reese Hoskins seventh. They had the bases loaded in the eighth to double play. In the sixth inning, they had Torres and Luke Williams get aboard, not able to knock anybody over. So over and over and over again, they had these chances. Sixth inning, seventh inning, eighth inning. And let's not overlook that Didi Gregorius error. I don't know what you're doing. You're making that throw. If you watch his feet and how he's basically falling backwards and trying to throw the ball to third base. That's, that's stupid baseball. That's what it is. And I consistently see this team do that multiple times a week where they look like they're six years old and they don't really truly think the game. And let's not overlook what the issue was at shortstop. Didi Gregorius has way too many errors. And it's not ironic that this team loses games when they make mistakes. And it goes back to Ronald Torres, who I gave on the Broads Media Twitter account, which you can follow at Broads Media. You can also toss me a follow on my regular Twitter, my personal, at Broads81. But that's why I gave Torres the not terrible player of the game He's playing right now on both sides of the ball. He's getting timely hits. He's getting big spots in the in the order when he's up the bat in the lineup, and he's delivering. He also can play defense. You lose baseball games when you are the second worst team in all of baseball, and that is exactly where they are. I can't stand it. That's why I feel personally that this loss stings more than just losing on the road to the New York Yankees because you put yourselves in bad spots. When you do this to yourself, it eats me alive way more compared to you tip your cap to the opponent. You say, okay, that was a nice how do you do. Let's move on to the next night. It's you sucked in the field. It's you had a big error. And you know what? Yeah. Gardner ended up hitting that home run after that play was made. So would it have been a two-run shot? Here's where I will fight back on that. When you're pitching, if you're Aaron Nola, the way that you pitch and the pitch sequence when an individual is on third base with two outs in the inning is way different than when you are pitching with bases emptied after one of your players in the field made such an egregious play that costed you. So you are focused differently. You pitch differently. Different pitch sequences. A lot changes. I can't say that Gardner would have hit that home run if the error did not happen because I don't think Aaron Nola and JT Romuto would have been in that type of mindset and had that type of approach if it was a different situation out there. So you know, that's just kind of the way I look at it. So I can't put that same exact outcome out there. So much changes. There's a huge domino effect. And, you know, I'm just disgusted with Didi in that spot. I, I would I would take players, you know, now that I've watched this team for so damn long now this season, I'm willing to take lesser players offensively if you can find ways to, to get defense out there. 
Because those fundamental plays, they're killer. It kills the emotion. It kills the swagger. It kills the confidence. Yeah, Didi has had some home runs. And yes, you know what? Offense is crazy. You look at Reese Hoskins, right? Offense is crazy good for him, and you can live with this defense. But the problem is if you have three players where that's the case, and keep in mind with Alec Bohm, it's not the case because he not as he has not been as explosive offensively. Giddy's making bad plays defensively, but he's hitting. Alec Bohm is making horrendous plays defensively, but he's hitting, and I'm using air quotes when saying that with those two players. And then Reese, he actually has been very, very, very damn solid offensively for the most part this year. And you can live with his, but I can't live with the others. You can't do that with three. It's just unacceptable. You will lose baseball games if that happens. And and that's why it's so painful. And that's why I think as Phillies fans, we are so stressed out and bothered and have so much annoying feelings in our heart because of the way it happened. It wasn't just your standard loss. You could have won this baseball game, no doubt. Sixth, seventh, eighth inning. It was there for the taking. Just mental mistakes. Little things, too. How about Bryce Harper? I mentioned that triple. When Bryce Harper plays the ball, he didn't play it off the wall. He tried to make the catch. It was a blistering missile. You got to play that off the wall, and then maybe you limit that to a double instead of a triple. Now, how much does that change? I don't know. The Yankees could still easily score in that moment, but... That's a little tiny thing that takes a player from third base to second base. That takes Allen from third to second. That's a huge difference maker in what possibly could be the inning. They tied the game up in that moment. Little things. Tiny things. Well, offensively, sometimes they do do the little things that I love. For example, Bryce Harper gets a blooper. Bryce Harper gets hits up the middle. Knows the shift is in play. Puts one up the middle. Ronald Torres, a little poke here. There is a culture shift in the way that they are playing. They're getting themselves in the spot. Then you got to execute, though. Then you have to cash in. There is something to be said about 6th, 7th, 8th. You're getting there. That is a big part of the pie here. You You do need to do that first. But then you also need to get the explosion. You need to start getting some rakes out in that moment. Rake one. Just rake one. I thought Reese was going to. Tough strikeout. But I don't necessarily uh, hate him for that moment. Sometimes you just have to tip your cap. And with Chad Green in that pitch, you have to tip your cap. I always go back to picking yourself up once you go down. And when Didi Gregorius makes such a terrible play and then he gets to the dish, well, you know what? Help out your teammates. Help out your brothers. Help out your guys. Look around in the clubhouse. Say, hey, fellas, I got it. All right, I know what I did earlier. I got it. I have a situation right in front of me, and I will deliver, and I'll put some runs up on the board. But instead, he got overpowered, and he was missing the barrel big time. Just sucks. It definitely sucks. What doesn't suck, though, is DraftKings Sportsbook. DraftKings Sportsbook is not only my favorite sportsbook, but also America's top-rated sportsbook. Speaking of America, our top athletes are over in Tokyo competing for the gold, and DraftKings has a medal-worthy offer just for my listeners. Listen to this great offer. Place any pre-event wager of $1 to be eligible to cash $100 in free credits if America wins any medal this year. Download the top-rated DraftKings Sportsbook app right now and use promo code BROADS when you sign up to turn $1 into $100 in free credits if America wins a medal. That's code BROADS to turn $1 into $100 in free credits for a limited time. Only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Must be 21 or older. New Jersey, Indiana, or Pennsylvania only. New customers only. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash Sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or in Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. Okay, let's go to the Anytime Hotline. Hear from the fans who are probably not happy. Anti-vaxxer NOLA is not an ace and don't let anyone convince you otherwise. Last time I checked, aces don't have ERAs well over four. The guy is a glorified Brett Myers. Go back to redneck land and take your mediocre pitching and your caveman political views with you, you fucking bum. 
Okay, that's just too aggressive in my opinion. That's that's too much. That's out there. And quite frankly, I don't like that at all. So we got to keep that tone down a little bit. Uh, you're allowed to feel the way that you feel about certain things. No one's really having the ace debate to bring this back to baseball. No one's really bringing that up anymore. Everyone knows that Zach Wheeler is the number one pitcher on the staff. And while you want him out of town, I don't, you know, like would I trade Aaron Nola because I think he has potential and another team can can find value in him and you can get prospects in return and get maybe ready to go guys in return that would benefit your franchise. Yeah, absolutely. I said this before, I'd be willing to move on from Nola and some of the other guys on this roster. But it's not because I think he absolutely stinks. I think it's because he's got a very solid team-friendly contract for what his ceiling can be and what even his average has been over the last handful of years. You would still take that and it would still tremendously help out 99.9 if not 100% of starting rotations in Major League Baseball. So it's not because he flat out stinks. No, this isn't who he is. He's more of a 3-5-0 ERA guy. Now he's playing in the fours and fives in this most recent stretch. You know, that's not Aaron Nola, so he needs to figure it out. I know it's in there, and I I think he has what it takes from an athlete perspective, a mindset perspective, to figure this out. I don't know if it's going to happen this year. I don't feel confident when he's on the mound. This season, I think this is who he is. Forever, though, I don't think this is who he is. He'll work on his mechanics. You know, there is some descriptions going on with that right now. And Dave Dombrowski even spoke about that with John Clark, about the movement in his mechanics and how maybe that's playing a role in where he is. Players do this all the time in golf, in tennis, in baseball, on offense, on on the pitching mound as well. You tweak the way that you pitch. You tweak the way that you hit. You tweak where your body is. You tweak all the time to try and you know find yourself when things get lost. I have faith in Aaron Nola more longer term, but this year, yeah, when he gets on the mound, it's not automatic win anymore. It's not, yeah, you're absolutely going to come out victorious like you do most of the time with a lot of these top end of the rotation pieces. With this team, though, I don't even know if I feel that way with Zach Wheeler just because this squad is so out there. They'll lose with Nola, win with a bullpen game. They'll lose with Zach Wheeler, win with Matt Moore. So because they do so many things unconventional and very weird and bizarre, well, that's another reason why I don't feel solid about it. But it is extremely disappointing because there used to be nothing better than Aaron Nola's dominance. When he go out there, the movement on his fastball, which is just lacking big time, where it was electric and you could see it move. Now you're trying to throw something to Brett Gardner. First off, the location is Two in, it's not inside enough to begin with, and then there's no movement, and that's why you know he's able to to get it out, even though it was weak, and even though it was a New York Yankee Stadium home run, he got enough on it on that given night for it to go out, and guess what? The run counts the same exact way. So you know, just very brutal to watch Aaron Nola. He doesn't feel like he's going to cruise when he's out there. You could see it in his face. You could see it in his body language, and then. At some point, the other team just gets into groove and gets into rhythm. and It's hard. It's definitely hard to witness. I don't feel the same way about Aaron Nola right now, and it stings. It used to be one of my favorite times of the week, you know? Because of the LSU ties, when the Phillies would tweet it out, it would be go Nola, but they would spell go like we're talking about LSU days. Now, yeah, can he go six? You're happy jumping up for joy, taking your shirt off and using it as a rally towel if he can go six. Ten of 19 starts, fewer than six innings pitched. How? How did we get to this world? All right, let's take another call here. If it'll load. This was a pathetic loss by the Philadelphia Phillies. I mean, Aaron Nola, like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Um, The offense left runners on late. Five base runners on. And they were getting in double play, striking out. I mean, just put the ball in play. Why don't we have the Ronnie Torres approach? Ronnie Torres puts that ball in play and good things happen. And we just couldn't get it done. And then we, when you have Kinzer and, and Yell, I mean, you know what's going to happen. So it's, it's a guaranteed home run each. It's like the home run derby out there. I mean, it's, you can't expect them to win tomorrow, but it is what it is. At least the Mets lost. 
So, you know, with the whole approach when they were striking out, when Reese Hoskins gets a 2-0 count with Chad Green on the mound, and you get that fastball right down the dick of the plate, and it was it was upper in the zone, but something that Reese Hoskins can hit a moonshot on when you have bases covered, and you could destroy one, and you already hit a home run that game. I don't have a problem with him going all out. That's what you pay Reese Hoskins to do. That's what you look at Reese Hoskins for. You get paid and you are that player where it's a hitter's count and you got many men on base and you need that game-changing hit. Go all out. You don't take the 0-2 count Ronald Torres approach when you're Reese Hoskins 2-0. Now, eventually he ended up striking out, but I can live with that because that's his job. That's his duty. With Didi, you know, he definitely brings power as well. But, you know, I don't look at this as the reason why they lost in some of these situations out there and, and with some of these players in the batter's box is because they were trying to hit too many home runs. If anything, they've done a good job as a team to bring back that old school style, and it has related in success. So I don't believe that's going anywhere, but some guys deserve that opportunity. Some players definitely get a little bit of a break and a little bit of a pass because that's what their job is as a player. We'll see. We'll see how they react tomorrow and face this adversity. A sweep would be extremely disappointing, but if they end up uh, winning against the Braves, we feel a lot differently about it. We need to know, even though they're in a stretch and all these games do matter, we need to toy with the emotions. It feels after that doubleheader against the Marlins, the sky was falling. And now after the Yankees end up beating you in game one, the sky is falling. But when you won the Marlins series, it was, wow, they won another series and this team is incredible right now. The emotions are getting very up and down and very extreme. We got to find a way to bottle it the right way. Enjoy the highs. Don't enjoy the lows, but understand the lows. But, you know, put it together in a package that makes sense. And that's kind of what I'm working with here. It all depends tomorrow, though, with the Yanks and, and how it plays out. We do have a couple text messages as well. I got to blow up the screen because I can't. Read it from my desktop that's in front of the camera. Okay. So this is Justin from South Jersey. Hey, Brody, very disappointed in DD's performance as of late. Seems like he is not able to handle the duties at short anymore. Infield defense has been atrocious this year and is no doubt going to continue to haunt us in the second half of the season. Love the show, long-time listener. Thank you very much, Justin. I appreciate that. Yeah, I've been screaming about the defense forever now. It's just as bad as the bullpen. Uh, you know, it's definitely an issue, and it's going to be a problem, but there's no fix. That's the thing. There really is no way to just automatically fix that. DD is your shortstop. Now, the Alec Bohm thing is fascinating. You know, he gets back from a COVID IL list, and is he going to be able to get right back in the lineup? How do they approach this? Because Torres is playing well. Are they just going to yank him out and say, sorry, there's no spots for you? Or do they work around the situation by getting Bone back in? And maybe with DD's errors, you throw Torres at shortstop for a night. I don't know what their plan is, and I'm looking forward to seeing what they do. But you, you can't win with Bone, DD, and Reese. That is just like the worst situation I could ever imagine in a million years with my infield defense. It will cost you a billion games. So how do you do it? I don't know. With Didi, though, it's it's definitely disappointing. And it's horrible to see. And it's now a lot in a short amount of time since he's returned. I feel like every three games I'm talking about a Didi error that was so significant, it changes the outcome. All right, this individual did not leave a name, but states, here is an honest question I want to bring up. Why do these sort of fall-offs always happen after errors from Didi more than any other infielder? At least it seems that way. Pitchers seem to brush off any errors from pretty much anyone else. It happened to Wheeler a couple of times tonight, a bit with Nola in the... Today, a bit Nola in the back. Want to give your take on this interesting topic, Broats? Asking in a question form, okay? That threw me off a little bit. Sure, I mean, I, I think that's just because it's happened as of late. Alec Boehm hasn't been available, but Alec Boehm has done this so many times, whether it's not catching a ball in foul territory, backing up and trying to play a bounce that ends up biting him in the face, goes over his head, or it doesn't 
hop as much, doesn't bounce as much as he anticipated. It goes underneath the glove or through his legs. So, you know, there's so many times where Alec Boehm has been terrible and the reason why you lost, but because he hasn't been available and on the diamond, maybe that's throwing it off for you. I just think it's more just your bias towards the time that we're in right now. You're thinking about where the Phillies are as of the last couple of weeks or so, and it's been more DD over the couple of weeks than anybody else, so it's fresher in your mind. So that's basically where that is at. Anything else, really, when looking at the notes? Andrew McCutcheon had that late homer. Will he continue the power? I'd imagine so, because it has been a significant amount of time at this point, so it kind of seems it is what it is with him, and he has the power back for the for the run here. And, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Can't wait for tomorrow. I was waiting for 7.05 all day long, and I got a long-ass baseball game. It's crazy. I'm looking at the score. It's 6-4, to four, and at one point it was around 5.2, 5.3, and we were about four hours into the baseball game. It just was a long one, and it, it was a grind of one, but we at least had the NBA Finals on at the same time to do a little double TV to put us through those slower moments. We'll see how they return tomorrow. Got to get that win. Got to split this series on the road. Thank you all so much for listening, and I will see you next time.